Welcome to Map Time. We'll be starting in a few minutes. We're going to wait for our co host uh, from the Leventhal Map and Education Center. And then we'll be welcoming uh, Andrea Olson from the Brainerd Earth Sciences Library and Map Collections. We already have a good Stanford contingent, I see, which is great to see. Um, so welcome everyone to map time, uh, whatever time of day it is where you are. Let's see if, no, I'm not actually sure if Garrett is coming today or not, but um, my name is David Weimer. I'm a uh, librarian at the Harvard Map Collection co-hosts of the Map Time series, which is a set of interviews with people that work in map libraries, that uh, work with maps, that make maps, that study maps, uh, pretty much anyone that has uh, interest in maps and their history and how they're made. Uh, we have all our past interviews up on YouTube. Uh, you can find those at the uh, Matt Harvard Map Collections YouTube channel. Um, and our future uh, events. You can find our schedule uh, up on the Harvard Library website. Uh, if you Google or Bing or um, use your favorite search engine to find uh, find it, you can just plug in uh, Map Time Harvard Harvard Map Collection or Harvard Library, and it'll come up. And you can see our coming our interviews coming up, uh, and our past interviews, and a link to the. Um, to previous instances. The, um, coming up, we have, uh, next week, actually, we have a, a Brainer double header. So next week, we have David Medeiros, uh, also from Stanford. Um, and then in the coming weeks, we have Martine Storms uh, from University of Leiden. Um, we have, uh, and some other uh, in June, we have a, a good slate of people that actually make maps, um, which will be, an, uh, I think, an exciting addition to the series. We've had a lot of people that study maps so far, um, and we're going to move on to a, uh, a set of different practitioners. Um, I don't see Garrett, so uh, I'm just going to bring in Branner here. So without further ado... Whoa. Hi, Dave. Hey, Andrea. Welcome to Map Time. Thank you. How are you? Good, good. How's the, how's the morning over there? Good. I got my cup of coffee. <laughs> good, good. Um, it's just definitely a, 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 thin, a thin window to accommodate both the West Coast and Europe. Uh, but we're trying. I'm a, a morning bird, so this is okay. All right, good. Um, <laughs> So as I said, so Andrea Olson is the assistant map librarian at Brander Earth Sciences Library and Map Collections at Stanford University, um, along with Julie Sweetkind Singer and David Medeiros, who are both uh, watching. Uh, Olson won Esri's 2019 Story Map of the Year. Story Maps is also watching, so we got <laughs> everyone in the house uh, for their pancakes and silver, uh, historic map reading, data extraction, and 3D visualization. She has degrees in art history, library science, and a diploma in Persian Farsi. Yeah. Um, so great. It's great to have you here. Um, you have an exciting set of maps to talk to us about. Um, so why don't you, uh, why don't we start, I'll bring up one um, just in the background here and you can, why don't you just tell us a little bit about um, the OSS and uh, and kind of what what the topic we're working with here is today. Sure. Um, so I also created a story map to go along with this, just because I'm a visual person, so I like to have cool things to look at. Um, so for anyone listening, if you want to follow along with what I'm talking about, you can go to uh, Bitly uh, backslash Eurofronts. Um, the link is on our. Instagram page and floating around. Um, 
so yeah, definitely, if you are able, pull that up and kind of follow along. Um, this, all of this was just kind of a serendipitous moment. Um, I had started working at Branner about a year and a half ago. And I was very new to map librarianship. I didn't really have a specific background in maps. Um, so at Stanford, especially with the map program, we're very committed to scanning maps um, that are out of copyright. And these maps being published by a federal agency, they're out of copyright, they're fair game. Um, so this was the first map series that crossed my desk when I started Stanford. Um, it was fresh from the scan lab. So I, like you mentioned, I have a diploma in Persian Farsi, so I was in military intelligence. Um, so it was just kind of a cool serendipitous moment. Um, I love mid-century design, and this, this is one thing I really love about OSS maps is kind of the simplistic mid-century design. Um, so yeah, just all of it just really caught my attention. Um, and this map series, as you, um, if you're looking at it, you'll see, um, it was a series of maps released on a weekly basis, um, starting um, kind of mid-1944, so kind of towards the end of the, the war. Um, so you get these really great uh, visualizations of how the war, you know, ended, how we, the Allied forces overtook and um, was able to finally defeat the Nazis. Um, so... Get into the history a little bit. I guess also when I first saw the maps, what kind of started all of this? Um, like I said, it's this movement from week to week, and there's a uh, just a short little GIF at the beginning of the story map of me flipping through the maps. That I took that little video the first moment I saw those maps, and I just so badly wanted to see them come to life. I want to see this visualization of the movements moving. Um, so that's what kind of started all of this. Um, so to just start off, I'm following along with the story map again, just a little brief history of the OSS. Um, so the OSS was the predecessor to the CIA. Um, it was the first coordinated effort by the United States uh, for strategic intelligence. Um, it was initiated during peacetime, but obviously that quickly shifted to wartime efforts. Um, so this was headed up by President Roosevelt. Um, in 1940, he was introduced to a man named William Joseph Donovan, uh, also known as Wild Bill. Um, Donovan was a World War I veteran and also a lawyer. Um, and President Ro Roosevelt was just immediately impressed with him, um, kind of his vision, his mission, um, and also just his intellect. Um, so even before uh, Donovan was appointed to any official position, uh, President Roosevelt actually confidentially sent him to greet, uh, Great Britain to meet with uh, Prime Minister uh, Winston Ch Churchill. Um, so after that, uh, President Roosevelt in 1941 officially um, selected Donovan to be his coordinator of information, or COI. Um, so this was the head position, but this was also uh, an entity. The COI was also an entity. Um, and they were the ones that kind of laid this groundwork for strategic intelligence. Um, so uh, when the United States officially entered World War, World War II after the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, the COI became formalized and turned into the Office of Strategic Services or the OSS. Um, so that happened in 1942. Um, so they, went, they would go on um, to just continue doing these intelligence efforts um, at its peak in 1944. The OSS employed a nearly 13,000 people, uh, men and women, which reading through their history, it sounds like they were actually very good about hiring women. Um, so it was just kind of a cool, fun tidbit. Um, so these 13,000 people worked in, there were various divisions under the OSS. Um, as an example, there was research and analysis, special operations, secret intelligence, counterintelligence, uh, research and development, just to name a few of the uh, kind of separate divisions that were there. Um, so yeah, they um, received a ton of information. I mean, millions of 
pieces of information during the war. Um, their job was to distill all this information, fact check it, fact check it. Um, and as a result of all this information that they were getting, um, speaking of maps specifically, they ended up producing 6,000 individual maps. Um, those were obviously reproduced and disseminated in very large numbers. Um, and these maps, a lot of them are individual, but some of them were also found in OSS reports. Um, so just kind of round out the history of the OSS. Um, so President Roosevelt died in 1945, April of 1945. Um, and the OSS, uh, especially Donovan, was not liked by the newly appointed President Harry Truman. Um, and at this time, Congress uh, was kind of seeking to just get rid of these war agencies, things that were stood up for this war. Um, so they really had no chance for survival and they were just very abruptly um, dissolved in October 1945. So almost immediately after the war was over, they were dissolved. Um, there was one of the stories was Donovan had 10 days to get all this stuff and get out and that was it. Um, so in the story map, there's a little um, quote from Donovan's farewell speech to his troops. Um, I just kind of a powerful uh, quote that um, he included within his farewell speech. Um, so that's just kind of a brief history of the OSS to get more into maps specifically of what they were doing. Um, so the COI, like I said, was the predecessor to the OSS. Um, they were mandated to collect and analyze all information and data which may bear upon national security. And obviously, obviously to us, maps were essential to fulfill this mandate. Um, so within the COI, they stood up a geography division. Um, and this was led by a man named Richard Hartshorn, who was a geographer and a professor. Um, and when the OSS, the COI was formalized into the OSS, Hartshorn went with them um, and became the head of the uh, geography division within the OSS. Um, so within this geography division, there was also a map division. Um, and there's another little story with this, Hartshorn. Um, I believe was living in Wisconsin at the time, but he had to be in DC for some of his duties. Um, he was making that drive and he stopped at the University of Ohio and there was a PhD student by the name of Arthur Robinson um, that he was just really impressed with. So this PhD student became the head of the maps division in the middle of a war. Um, so just kind of a crazy moment. Um, so within the map division, there was, again, more subdivisions. Um, so there's special photography, cartography, map information, and topographic models. Um, and yeah, like I said, they were just receiving tons of information, millions of pieces of information, and they were um, photos, newspaper clippings, reports from the field overseas, books, articles, and their whole purpose was to just distill this information and create maps um, and these maps initially were created only for internal consumption. Um, so after the war was over and these maps uh, eventually be, uh, were started getting disseminated to libraries across the country. Um, so the maps that we have in our collection, and I'm assuming those uh, other libraries are stamped with things like confidential or restricted. Um, so just kind of this cool insight. Um, internal consumption and then now we get to kind of view what they were looking at. Um, this particular map series, the European Fronts, when you look at it, you'll see it's fairly generalized. Um, it's not super informative, but it is kind of a quick look um, for just week to week to just see how uh, the ebbs and flows of the military movements, especially over this kind of last year, year and a half to the war. Um, so that's really I want to talk about. I'm not a historian, but this, to me, learning about the maps through kind of these digital methods, such as the story map, is um, it's just fun for me. Um, so my role at Branner, I manage the paper map collection, um, contemporary paper map collection from about 1920 to present. Um, so 
one of my big passions and my big questions is, you know, how to get people engaged with these paper maps? How do we give these maps a kind of a second life? How can we start learning from them? Um, and I'm especially beholden to students. I love working with students and I love seeing them get excited and creative with the maps. Um, so getting into kind of the projects surrounding these maps, um, first I'm gonna just kind of bring attention to, um, we have this digital exhibit platform called Spotlight at Stanford. Um, so this is just a way for us to highlight digital resources and kind of build the stories around these digital resources. Um, so our mother of maps, Julie Sweetkind Singer, made this, um, made a spotlight at Stanford for the OSS maps. Um, so if you're in the story map, we're scrolling down, we're on the fourth section, all the links are there to kind of explore um, this exhibit. Um, admittedly, I was just kind of ex uh, experimenting with some of our the ArcGIS story maps new features. So I created this map of, as a different way to kind of explore um, explore the spotlight exhibit. So within the story map, you can explore it. You can search by country or search by theme, which is how the spotlight exhibit is laid out. Um, so thank you, Dave, for pulling that up. So Dave is on the spotlight exhibit right now. Um, so you can kind of see how this is laid out. And it's just an easy way to explore the full OS, uh, OSS collection that we have and then also learn more about the history. Um, so that's one way that we, one digital method that we employ to kind of um, give these maps a second life, um, let people kind of relearn from them. Um, so that was the first thing that was done with these maps. Um, so then going back to the moment that I saw these collection, uh, these the series of maps and wanting to see it come to life. Um, we, like I said, I didn't have experience coming into uh, being a map librarian, especially with uh, GIS applications. Um, so I got this idea. The first thing I do when I have a crazy idea is run down to David Medeiros' desk, who is our uh, geospatial instruction and reference specialist. I call him my geospatial Yoda. Um, so I have this idea. I want to, want to see these maps come to life. So it just ended up being the perfect project for me to learn how to georeference historical maps in ArcMap. Um, so just little learning moments, because to me, this is kind of what that's all about, is just learning new skills and then being able to teach people these skills. Um, one learning moment that came for me from georeferencing these maps was recognizing the fact that they're printed in layers. Um, so the water is one layer, the country border lines is one layer, the town markers is one layer. Um, so initially I had geo-referenced the maps kind of with a combination of city markers and border markers, I think. And doing that, there was just enough offset between the first three or four maps that I geo-referenced for it to be noticeable. Um, so it was just a small learning moment of like, okay, I need to pick consistent control points. So I ended up picking just the town markers and geo-referencing. Um, from that to just get kind of a perfect geo-reference experience. Um, so that was the first project, first portion of this project. Um, and then we all at Branner, we have our student assistants that we would be nothing without. Um, so Justin Kong, he is the hero of this project. Um, he is David and Stace's uh, student GIS assist, assist, assistant, but the coolest thing about this is that he's in high school. Um, so he's just doing awesome stuff. Um, so he did what none of us wanted to do. I started doing this on one map and I was like, you know what? I think I have something <laughs> I'm <to> go do. <laughs> um, so he geo -refer or digitized every single polygon from every single map so we could eventually get to this point of having this visualization. <laughs> Um, so just amazing. Can we, uh, yeah, yeah, can we just let me, I wanted to ask, so for people that don't know, um, to make the kind of visualizations that you were able to make with this map to show the movement of the, the front, you have to, there's not yet the kind of holy grail of uh, digitizing maps uh, is, you know, automated feature extraction or kind of vectorization. And, uh, 
it's not yet easy in any uh, no. way to to just say I extract the railroad or extract the roads or extract these red borders that are moving from map to map and so you have to have someone go in and trace them by hand in the program and that's what you're talking about when you're saying drawing the polygons yeah um so this is a huge thing i mean this is the maddening part i think of being a map librarian but any librarian i mean because i'm also we're also responsible for cataloging these maps and there is just so much information buried in these maps, but we, right, we don't have the technology yet to OCR, um, just automatically read all this information on maps, um, which is something we're working on. We'll get there someday. Um, so there's a lot of map nerds behind the scenes working on these things. Um, so yes, definitely very interested in AI when it comes to maps and how can we optimize um, because we put so much work into digitizing the maps and making them available free to the public. Um, how can we make this experience even better? Um, so yeah, we're definitely into this. Yeah, uh, um, I saw an interesting talk uh, by a couple of scholars whose names I'm forgetting um, that are at Sheffield and then I think a university in Finland now um, that are using machine learning to try and get uh, words off maps. Um, but it's it's very difficult because the words are never in the same orientation and they're in different fonts and they're different sizes. Um, and they're buried in like, colors yeah. and lines yeah, are exactly. going. Yeah, it's it's tricky business for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, so there's a lot there. I wonder, one of the questions I had was um, if you knew how um, people were using uh, these OSS maps so that, you know, you, you talked about they're having um, uh, internal circulation within uh, the military. Um, were they sent off to Europe? Were they used uh, merely kind of in domestic offices for planning? Do you have any sense of how, what use they were put to? No, I didn't come across that specific information when I was compiling kind of the history aspect. Um, so no, I mean, that is a good question. I when I was on the CIA uh, website getting some of the history of the OSS, they had an image actually of a playing card um, that when you got the top of that playing card wet, it dissolved and there was a map in there. Um, so maybe that's insight at <laughs> all for using these maps. I'm not sure. I mean, this particular map set I feel like isn't super informative. I feel like it's more just aesthetically interesting than anything and gives you kind of this broad generalization of how the movements were mm -hmm. um but yeah, yeah not useful not useful on the in the field but useful for right. uh, news organizations or for kind of general planning saying you know this is how it's changed from week to week yeah yeah um, um but yeah i you know who would know the answer to this if she, if there is a known answer is julie uh julie really did a deep dive on the history so maybe she'll if she knows the answer maybe throw it in uh, yeah but yeah no i didn't see i didn't see that specific information when i was just yeah. doing yeah the brief history research i'm, I'm uh, also curious what um so you have uh unlike uh I think many of the librarians that work on these OSS maps, you have a background in military intelligence. Yeah. Um, and so I'm curious what, how these, you know, looking at these maps, how they compare to maps that you made or you worked with uh, in military intelligence, like how has that presentation of information changed over time? Like what similarities and differences do you see? Um, I mean, the work that I was doing, I can't say I ever saw a paper map for the purpose of work that we were doing mm -hmm. related to this. Um, mm -hmm. There was digital mapping for sure, a lot yeah. of that. Um, but <laughs> it's, yeah, I, we'll, yeah, we'll leave it at that. There was digital right. map. <laughs> <laughs> digital mapping. <laughs> the person that's <laughs> Yeah, I, I realize it might be a question you might not want to answer live on the air. I wouldn't tell you. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, you know, I, you also have, um, so the, the story maps, they, 
you know, there's a lot of different um, <clears throat> things you're doing with them. And I'll just bring it up for people that haven't seen it yet. But um, I guess I'm curious how you think about the, the form of the story map. So what, um, what do you, kind of what do you find most useful about the system and kind of what do you, um, yeah. for being able to tell stories about maps and then kind of how do you, um, what are you kind of looking for uh, in different, you know, because there are different ways that we try to tell stories with maps and bring them to life um, in these different formats, whether it's physical or digital exhibitions and kind of what are you, what are you looking for in systems and um, formats to be able to tell stories about maps? Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I said, I'm not a historian. I think more into kind of the creative way of engaging people with paper maps um, because like, yeah, I manage our paper map collection and there isn't a ton of usage. So I, I feel very passionate about trying to get people um, interested in maps that maybe aren't normally interested in maps or don't, cons they don't, it's not the first thing that comes to their mind as a primary source to use in their research or their class projects or whatever it is that they're doing. Um, so the, what I love about the story maps, uh, I, you know, maybe I get an hour with a student and to me, this is a very great way to really optimize that hour and create something that's visually enticing. Um, and I have kind of this art history design background. So I, I honestly, when I look at maps, that's kind of the first thing that I notice or think about what you could be doing. Um, so that's what I love about story maps. Um, I, my big thing is distilling complex information into something that's kind of informal, enjoyable. It's a quick learn. Um, cause I mean, I think about back when I was learning these topics, um, and especially the visual visualizations that we did, um, being a visual person, it, you to kind of learn this from a textbook and it was hard for me. I wasn't seeing these connections between, oh, the, you know, Normandy invasion is going on here and at the same time, Operation Bagration was going on up here and like all of this kind of comes together for the big picture. Um, so that's what I really love about this map set. And then also um, kind of exploring how to present that digitally. Mm -hmm. um, so to, uh, yeah, to me, it's all about just creating kind of memorable, fun learning experiences um, and just really seizing the moment, any short moment that I have with students, especially of reconsider maps, um, especially think of them as primary sources, because they really are primary sources when it comes to uh, politics or culture. Um, all of this is reflected in the maps. Um, so, yeah, it's it, we have like I mean, you know the, especially our community we have all these map nerds it's it's uh it's just second nature for us to think of maps like once we hear something or see something but i come across a lot of people that that is not how it is for them they just don't think of maps they kind of think of you know how to get from point a to point b um so for me it's all about kind of exposing the tr you know everything that maps contain um so that's what I love about story maps. That's what I love about kind of doing these fun, um, just digital projects, um, because it is interesting to students and it, that gets them excited. And we have our student assistants. Um, so it's just really good opportunities to kind of start planting these seeds. Um, and yeah, I'm not a historian, but you know, my hope is that a historian sees this and is like, oh, you could take this this way or do it something like this. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I see myself as. It's just kind of the idea brewer, and I'm just hoping mm -hmm. someone get it and run with it. Yeah, and so part of what you're describing is how you know maps. Um, two of the ways that that you can make maps um, kind of more um, accessible and kind of engage different audiences in them is one by revealing the stories behind them and and that surround them and then also the kind of data aspects of them and how do you bring the, the information that's on the maps into um, kind of digital systems and then how do you combine those two and like tell the stories with the data and tell the stories with the paper maps themselves. Yeah. Um, which sounds great. It's great work. Yeah. <laughs> Having fun with um, maps. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
the so do we have any questions from the uh the peanut gallery here so anyone, if you have any questions throw them into the little uh rectangle with a question on it you can just type it in i'm going to scroll through and see if anyone has put questions <clears throat> just in the comments um I w i'll also note that uh so you mentioned arthur robinson as the um the head of the map division of the uh oss he then became a very famous uh cartographer and uh he was the head of the international cartographic association and then vice president and president of the american association of american geographers um, yeah. so he's a, he's a he's a big name um, <laughs> the um i don't see any questions but um the, it's been great having you. And we have our, our Brainer double header uh, next week. We'll have uh, Dave Medeiros here talking about his maps. Um, he, he will probably talk some about this digitization, but also just about designing maps uh, on computers for print, uh, which people still do. Yeah. Um, and yeah, do, any, other, any other thoughts? Nope, that's it. Thank you so much All for right. having Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, this has been great. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to everyone. Okay. Yep. All right. We'll see you all next week. Uh, same time, same place. All right. Good to see you.